All right, Revelation chapter 12. Um, when we looked at that, with that beginning of new visions as he went, you know, 1 through 11 really is a set together, and then 12 to the end of the book is a set together. And 12, of course, you have the introduction of the woman, you have the dragon that is there to devour the child that the woman gives birth to, but the child's caught up to heaven. Uh, the dragon turns his attention to the offspring of the woman. And so the idea of persecuting the church, going after individual Christians, trying to destroy them. Then in chapter 13 is where the dragon is mentioned again, but then also it talks about this beast from the sea and beast from the earth. And when we talked about that beast from the sea, who was that? What is that representing and what's it about? Okay, Roman Empire, uh, probably even representing the emperor, whoever that emperor may be. At this time, it happened to be Domitian, who is the emperor, but he has characteristics of the dragon. The dragon is the one, Satan is the one behind that power that's moving against Christians, that's going after them and persecuting them. But then the beast from the earth, what do we identify that as? False religion. False religion, exactly right. And what was the role of the beast of the earth? What was its mission, its purpose? It was to compel people to worship the first beast. So remember, the, the issue facing Christians was to be a patriot of Rome and a loyal citizen of Rome and to have the authorization to engage in commerce, you had to pay homage to the emperor as a living God, as a deity. And so that emperor cult that was especially strong in Asia Minor was putting pressure upon and going after even punishing those to the point of death who would not offer up the incense to the emperor. And so the second beast of the earth, the false religion, pushing, compelling, persecuting people so that they would worship the first beast, the emperor. And so we have that terrible um, picture there in chapter 13 of these two beasts with the dragon behind them and animating them and giving them power, if you will. Well, in chapter 14, the opening part of it, 1 through 5, we get a completely different picture and a great contrast to those terrible and dreaded beasts. So let's read uh, Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Who will grab that for us? Watch it. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and, the, and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the, except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not filed with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Okay. So you've got the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. Um, the Lamb. Any guesses? Any Wondering as to who that is? Of course, who is it? It's Christ, Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one who's given himself as a sacrifice. So you think about this contrast between these beasts and a lamb. And the lamb standing on Mount Zion, which would be representative water. Let me ask you this. When you go back in biblical history, what is and where is Mount Zion?
Okay, Jerusalem. There is a specific mountain that was Mount Zion. That's where Solomon built the temple. But then Jerusalem as a whole came to be known as Zion. Um, if you fast forward, just keep your place there in Revelation 14. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 and... We want to do a little bit longer reading here. Let's go verses 18 down to 24. Hebrews 12, 18 to 24. Who will read that for us? Elijah. We do not come to the mountain that have any touched in that burnt with fire, to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned with chalk of an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who were registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of angels. Okay, so the Hebrew writer telling them, look, you haven't come to that mountain that Moses stood on, that Israel stood around, that shook and smoke and all that stuff going on, but you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and goes on with other descriptions there. So we get to Revelation 14, and it says this lamb is standing on Mount Zion. What picture do you get, especially with what follows? because of who's with him. What, what's the idea here? It's the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, and the holy host that will be there with him. Yeah, it's, it's that picture of this is where God meets his people, where he dwells with his people, where he connects with his people. Remember, going back into the Old Testament, it... Jesus, or the Lord had said, you know, I'm going to put my name in a particular place in the promised land. That place ended up being the city of Jerusalem. It ended up being there at the temple when Solomon built it. That's where he came and he manifested himself to his people and, and they worshipped him and had fellowship with him. That's where they had to go to offer up the sacrifices and observe the feast days and all those kinds of things. And so it's saying that's where God connects with his people, where he has fellowship with them. Now that was that old system. In the new one, as the Hebrew writer is pointing out, we, we don't go to a physical mountain, but we are at Mount Zion. We are in fellowship with God. We are in the presence of the angels and things like that. And so, here in Revelation 14, he's giving that picture. Look, here's the Lamb, the Son of God, who's on Mount Zion, that place where God dwells with His people, and with him are who? 144,000. 144,000. Of course, where did we run into them before? Chapter 7. Chapter 7, when they were marked out for as belonging to the Lord. Now, it's interesting that the close of chapter 13, he talks about you know this mark of the beast, this number of the beast that's put on these people, you know, 666, and then it jumps right into, hey, here's those 144,000 whose father's name is written on their foreheads. So here, here's the ones who are marked out for the beast, and oh, by the way, let me remind you, there's this other group over here that has the mark of God on them that belong to Him, which we'll talk more about in just a little bit. But the Lamb and his people are being described here, being shown here, they're unaffected by the beast. You have these beasts, you, you have all this torment, all this persecution, this idea of them going after people on earth to make them worship the beast and really worship the dragon, worship Satan. But then here's this beautiful picture of the Lamb of God standing on Zion with his people, with the redeemed, who are with him and around him. All right. So what are they doing while they're there, verses 2 and 3? What, what does John hear? 
What does it sound like? Playing of harps and singing a new song. Okay, the playing of harps, the singing of new song. Um, it says like the voice of many waters. What is that? Get loud. Has anybody ever been to Niagara Falls? And I've never been. I've just heard, but what is what does it sound like? It's just overtaking you with this roar of the water that's going over the falls. And that's all you hear. How, how do you speak to each other when you're near those falls? Right up next to someone's ear. You're talking <laughs> into it and you're shouting. Yeah, that's that's the picture being given to us here. This voice of it's overwhelming. This voice that is coming out and speaking. Um, the voice of loud thunder. Uh, all of us, I'm sure, have had times when we've been in that thunderstorm. Not, not the one that we hear out in the distance, but the one where literally the house shakes. You know, of course, that's because of the lightning and I think it's a percussion wave that pops out of that lightning and hits that house and it can shake dishes even at times. You know, you, you just hear it. And it shakes the voice of thunder. That's what it's like. And it's giving us again that image of being there in the presence of God and Him speaking. Sort of like on Mount Zion, or rather Mount Sinai, when He spoke to the people, it overwhelmed them so badly. They said, no more, get Moses, let Moses talk to us. Mike, do you have something? So that's the picture being drawn here. And heard the sound of harpists playing their hearts. And as was mentioned a while ago, they sang the new song before the throne, the four living creatures, the elders, the ones who we've been introduced to prior to this back in four and five and so on. So no one can learn that song except the 144,000. So the identity of this 144,000, who does it say they are? What are some of the descriptors given? Verse 3 to start with. They have been redeemed, right. Yeah, it says that they belong to God. They're the first fruits of God. What else does it say about them? Verse 4. They're undefiled and they're followers of the land. Undefiled in what way? Um, morally pure. Okay. It says undefiled with women. They're virgins. Uh, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit, but 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, and verse 2, that's not it. 2 Corinthians 11. Yes, 2 Corinthians 11. And verse... Two, what somebody read that for us. See what Paul mentions that connects here. For I am a, for I am jealous for you with God through jealousy. For I am for I have betrothed you to one husband, and that I may present present you as a chastened virgin to Christ. Okay. So that imagery is already built into the biblical text that Christians are like virgins, they're undefiled <clears throat> because we're a part of the church which is the bride of Christ and we need to be able to be presented to Him pure. And so here, talking about that 144,000, the redeemed, it makes sense that it would describe those redeemed as undefiled with women, virgins, they're morally pure, as Nancy said. Um, and what do they do? Verse 4. It says they do something. Follow the Lamb. Follow the Lamb. But where did Jesus talk about that? That Mike led us through a study of about Wow, I guess it was 10 weeks ago, 11 weeks ago. Maybe 13, but... 
Jesus said, My sheep hear me and know my voice and they follow me. Right? John 10. They follow me. These are ones who hear the Lamb and they are following Him. That's the only way they can follow Him. So they're, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And they are first fruits to God and to the Lamb. They, they've been offered up as an offering to Him. And the first fruits, there's more to come, more that will follow after this. So, question one, I ask this question. In these first five verses here, uh, they're used to support a couple of different, rather prominent false doctrines. Um, can you name one of them? And then answer those false doctrines out of these verses themselves. Anybody have one that's people point to right here, Mike? I know Jehovah's Witnesses teaches 144,000 of the first 144,000 Christians that died on earth. And they actually made it to heaven, and that's why they teach that um, if you are a follower of God, you'll be here on earth forever because that 144,000 has already been selected. Yeah, heaven's full. <laughs> yeah, um, I've had a few discussions through the years with Jehovah's Witnesses and they are firmly convinced that heaven is reserved for a few elites and that 144,000, everybody else is going to be here on earth. And by the way, that presents two hopes. Right? Instead of one hope, that's two hopes. And it's interesting to me that they say man can live on earth forever, but so can a donkey and a rat and, you know, a wolf. And it's like you've got the same hope as an animal, which I don't know how they sort that out, but I, I cannot sort that out. Be that as it may, how do you answer that from this text? It says, look, there's 144,000. It's pretty specific. Redeemed. Okay, they're the redeemed. Yeah, the 144,000 redeemed. All the other redeemed stuck here on earth. Well, the language in those five verses is figurative. And if you make this literal, you have to make everything literal. Okay, so if it is a literal 144,000, what else is... Do well, we have harps. to agree to here? The harps, the instrumental music. Oh, okay. That's number two. There's a lamb in Mount Zion. Is there really a lamb and a physical mountain in heaven? Right? That's the, because that's what you got to go with. Anything else? Married people need not apply. Married people need not apply because they're virgins. Right? Virgin males, really, is what it's talking about here. So if you go down that road of 144,000 is literal, then you have to take these other things as literal, and it completely wrecks everything else that the Bible teaches, right? So you can answer it out of this text. The other doctrine that is widely supported out of this, Nancy? The harps. Or mean instrumental music is fun. Okay. Look, right here it says they're in heaven and they're playing their harps. How do you answer that out of here? It says the voice sounds like playing harps, not that they're actually working harps. Aha. Sounds like. Right? I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters like the voice of loud thunder i heard the sound of harpists playing their harps as he heard this sound but what did they do verse three they sang so the voice that was speaking wasn't you know making this big whooshing sound like there's this great waterfall there that's, we know that, right? I mean, you read it and you don't go, well, he was in there mimicking a, a great waterfall. Or he was in there, he was there mimicking thunder. Boom, boom, you know, that kind of thing. It, that's not what's happening. 
it's, a, it's describing these characteristics of how overwhelming it is. And then when it talks about these harps and being like the harps or the uh, harpists, the sound of harpists playing their harps, he's just referring to the beauty of that that is being sung because they sang the new song. Uh, they are speaking those words. So there's a pretty good argument to say he actually never even saw a harp in this passage. He heard something that sounded like harps. But let's grant, let's just say, okay, all these 144,000 actually had their own harp and they were strumming it and singing. What does that prove? Nothing. They're in heaven. Heaven is not earth. Right. Number one, this is a picture of heaven. It's not a picture of earth. You, you can get them in heaven, okay? You can get them with David, something like that, but you can't get them in the church. You never see that in the Bible. Number two, again, if you're going to take this as literal, you've got the same problem as 144,000. You've got to accept that as literal. The lamb is literal. The mountain is literal. Literally, there are only virgins, males who are going to heaven. I mean, you just have all kinds of problems. So, if somebody brings these things up to you, you can have confidence just in this passage to show, yeah, that doesn't work. Any thoughts or questions before we press on? Mike? Well, the answer to both of those things we just talked about was making something that's bigger to make it literal. And that is prevalent whenever we look at things in Revelation. We're trying to look at things that we have in front of us, very tangible, and applying it to a very bigger degree. So you know, the answer analyzing in that and a lot of these things where false doctrines come from. Right. And it's very interesting if you if you get very um, detailed in studying a lot of false doctrine or people who have accepted false doctrine, they'll take what is figurative and make it literal and what is literal and make it figurative. They completely flip-flop it. And that's because that's the only thing they can do to really make their doctrine stick and fit and go together in some type of sense, at least the way they reason it out. All right, let's read verses 6 through 13, please. Revelation 14, verses 6 through 13. Who will grab that for us? Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel preached to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Hear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven, earth, and sea, and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying, with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image, and receives his mark on his forehead, or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be formed with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment since forever and ever, and they shall have no rest, day or night, who worships the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. For here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the labor, that they may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. Very good. Question number two, I ask, what three things are the people of the earth told to do? Where is this message found and how can these things be done? So, three parts to one question. What are they told to do? Fear God, give him glory, worship him. Fear God, give him glory, worship him. And where are these things found? What, what's the picture being given to us here? So as this angel's flying in the midst of heaven, what does he have? The 
lives in well on earth is, has the everlasting gospel. Yeah, he has the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth. So he's he's got the gospel. You know, the Bible talks about, including in 1 Peter chapter 1, how that this the word of God lives and abides forever. That's the same concept being given here. Here's the everlasting gospel. This is God's message to man to the end of time. So you've got this everlasting gospel to be preached. So that's where we find these things. Uh, fear God, give glory to Him, and worship Him. So how are these things done or what how might we elaborate on them? What about the idea of fear God? Think about the context of the people receiving this letter. He showed humility before God, putting in his proper place in our lives. What what did Jesus admonish the apostles about? He put it in the negative. Well, he said, don't fear man, fear God. Exactly. Why? Because he can destroy both body and soul. Yeah, they can destroy your body. That's all they can do. God can take you and throw you in the pit of hell. So, fear God, not man. And these Christians need that admonition. Remember in chapters 2 and 3, he repeatedly emphasizes that idea of you need to be serving God. You're going to go through tough times, but you need to remain committed to God. Um, so fear God, not man. How about give Him glory? How do we give God glory? By being obedient to His commandments is one way. Okay. Recognizing Him as sovereign and all authority and of course we are as we know, required to recognize you know, for in Him we live and move and have our very being. Yes, yes, exactly. And over in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21, it says to Him, that is, God the Father, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. You know, there are people who deny that we have to be a part of a church. They would say that as a, a universal body. They would say that as a local body. They would say, well, I can just have a personal relationship with the Lord and you know, I don't have to be a part of any group at any time in any way whatsoever. But we give glory to God in the church because the redeemed, of course, are part of the church. And so we give Him glory. We serve in the church. Um, give Him glory as these Christians would need to do when they're facing the sword that they honor God still when they're facing that. They don't renounce the Lord Jesus Christ when they are being threatened. And then, of course, worship Him. Um, how difficult would it be for these people to worship the Lord? When they've got the dragon, they've got the beast they're facing. I, you know, I can't imagine. Mike, yes? Yeah, I think that's why they had the admonition is there also to remind them that you know, this is a hard time. But you still got to do what you got to do. You still got to be a Christian. Right, exactly right. Don't, don't pull back from that. Don't shy away from it. Even if you're arrested and you're facing death, you need to keep pressing on, remaining faithful and true. So, question number three then, I ask, what is Babylon and what had she done? Would that possibly be Rome? Okay, Rome in what sense? Because we've got, you know, we've got this first beast of the sea that's Imperial Rome or the Emperor. You've got the beast of the land that is the emperor cult enforcing that false worship. Joe? Alright. By that, that was a of different peoples and cultures. Um, and what? In our house at the time. You know, I had their religion. 
Yeah, yeah. big mix. Roman condemnations, and they were requiring emperor worship. Mm -hmm. And this is coming to an end. It is. It's, it's going to come to an end for sure. And you go back in biblical history, Babylon was one of the great enemies of the people of God. I mean, you go into Isaiah and him prophesying about the fall of Babylon. Babylon represented corruption, decay, immorality. And here it really stands for that culture of the Roman Empire. And the, the paganism that is present there, uh, the immorality that is present there. So what we're getting here is just another view or another angle at what the Christians were facing. They're facing the emperor, they're facing that emperor cult, the false religion, the political authority, and here is kind of the culture being represented as you're up against that, but guess what? What, what is that culture doing? What does it say, by the way, the, the latter part of verse 8? What's, what's Babylon actively engaged in? Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. And saying it's going out and made all the nations drink the wine. Actively corrupting, pushing that corruption on <laughs> others. So then it says Babylon, what? Verse 8. Just dial this in a little more. It's fallen. Is fallen. Not what? Not will fall. It is fall. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 46 just to note this, just grabbing this language here. Isaiah 46 and verse 10. Isaiah 46 verse 10. We'll read that for us. Okay. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. Okay. God sometimes describes something as done when it still literally has to be fulfilled, but because He has declared it so, it's a given. It is going to happen. Right? Um, Jesus in John 17, when he said, It is finished, I have finished the work you've given me to do. Well, he was still headed to the cross, he was still going to be resurrected, still spend 40 days with his disciples and ascend into heaven. But it was a given, it was a done deal, if you will. So Babylon is fallen, is describing the fall of Rome as a given. It's a foregone conclusion that this is going to happen. Um, so then it talks about verses 9 through 11, this punishment on those who worship the beast. In question 4 I ask, what will the wor worshipers of the beast may be made to do? And I asked you to identify the irony with what was discussed earlier, which that may have been too vague. But, so what, what, what is it that's going on here? What, are the, what will the worshipers of the beast be made to do? Drink the wine of the wrath of God. Drink the wine of the wrath of God. Um, the wine of the wrath of God. Uh, his wrath abides on those who live in rebellion to Him. And so that fits those who are worshipers of the beast, who have the mark of the beast on them. And He's saying God's going to make them drink this wine poured out in full strength into the cup of His indignation. Um, what had they been doing? What kind of wine had they been drinking? Okay. Okay, yeah, very often it would be diluted, not full strength, and 
Well, it's, it's described in the previous verse when it's Babylon doing it as the wine of wrath of fornication. And, and they're, two, they're both cups, and they both have wrath. One is, is just on earth. If you didn't do that, you were persecuted by Babylon. But God's cup of wrath is eternal. Yeah, it's a, it's a temporary thing. Stephen, can we say that they're going to be drinking the, the product of their works here because of this wrath and indignation and all forms of ungodliness? Right. When, when they... When they drank of the wine of Babylon, what, what was their motivation, their purpose, their intent? Let's just take literally fornication, Clint. Just to be consumed by the lust. Consumed by the lust. Some type of pleasure. Maybe it is to avoid the pain of punishment from you know, the imperial power. Well, just thinking about that, it's interesting that uh, I think Rome got a small glimpse to the height of its power, or just how vulnerable it was. I mean, if you're familiar with history, you know that Armenians, the German uh, guy that, that fought with the Romans, they destroyed two legions, two entire Roman legions, which was unheard of. Mm -hmm. You know? And that kind of brought Rome down to reality that they weren't so high and mighty. And that was the time of the I mean, ironically, uh, those Germanic tribes not the same ones, but they burned Rome about 500 years later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, they. I kind of wonder sometimes if that wasn't one of the heads that was, that was injured. I, I mean, just personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here, you, you've got the people who have decided to worship the beast that would bring them that pleasure or the avoidance of pain. So, if you will, they drink for pleasure, and now God's going to make them drink the pain. And, and it is really a result of the decisions that they've made that that wrath is going to come about because they've decided to give in to the beast. They've decided to pursue these things, the idolatry, the immorality, all these things that are involved in that, Mike? Yeah, the word cop, you know, is used throughout specifically the New Testament as very symbolic of things like whenever Christ said, let this cup pass from me, you know, mm -hmm. he's fixing to drink out of that wrath of God because he's putting all of the sins of the world upon him. Uh, he also tells uh, his apostles, you know, you're not able to drink the cup in which I'm going to be drinking from. Uh, numerous times it's used throughout, you know, to symbolic, uh, symbolically uh, to represent, you know, wrath, indignation, uh, suffering, suffering. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't think this would have been a new, um, new message to them that they would know what this meant. Right, right, exactly. And as it talks there about the, the full strength of it, the, the drinking of it is the idea of it completely. It, it's like it's in you. It's, it's a part of you. It completely fills you up, if you will. But poured out full strength on them, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So it's looking to that torment that they're going to face. And how long does that torment last, does it say? Or gives a um, description there in verse 11. Okay, the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Um, does anybody remember something similar to that? Language similar to that? It's in the book of Jude in particular. It talks about how that Sodom's destruction was a, a thing of eternal judgment. Eternal fire. And the idea is this judgment would ring down through the ages that people could point to that and they would go, that's what happens to people who rebel against God. And we can point to these. This is what happens to people who rebel against God. Besides the fact that they will be eternally tormented um, from the time they die and they go into torments to the time that they will be cast into hell. There is that eternal judgment that is there. But this is, this is a, a, um, a warning to everybody else. 
this is what happens to those who worship the beast and his image whoever receives the mark of his name this is your fate this is what's going to be your end when it's all said and done all right any thoughts down through 11 mike uh, yeah very quickly you know whenever we partake of the, the lord's supper we partake of that cup and it says this cup is the representative of the new testament for the new uh, covenant with mankind whereas you have this cup rapid indignation for those who follow God receive the cup of the new covenant. Yeah, the cup of fellowship with Him. Yeah. All right. Um, so I asked you to explain verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Anybody have any thoughts on that? These saints who are facing these beasts and this culture, Ron? I was just going to say that you know this chapter, as you had mentioned, is a departure from what we've just been reading because it's talking about God will prevail, God, and if we are faithful, keep His commandments, and we realize that the Word of God will always be before Him, and He's given that to us now. What great consolation and hope that we have by keeping His commandments. Our life is that of being commandment keepers. And He's saying here that, you know, here's the patience of the saints. Patient continuance and well-doing, and you will receive the reward. Exactly. Patient as God would mete out justice. Remember, we said, you know, chapters 1 through 11, you have these themes talking about judgment, looking at the saints, they're crying out how long. God says... Don't worry about it. Just be patient. There's more time to be spent here. There's others who are going to give their life. I'm going to bring these judgments. And he reveals various things. And here you have these types of themes being repeated, being reiterated. Here's what's going to happen. So here's the patience of the saints. Yes, God is going to take care of those who worship the beast. It's going to happen. You may not have any power to stop it. You, you may, may not have any influence on your friends and family to get them to turn away from that. And God is going to call them to account. There's going to be that day of reckoning. And so he follows that up with, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. And their labors, of course, they're going to have rest, and their labors, their works will follow them. So how do the works of the saints follow them after they're dead? How's that happen, Nancy? I, I think, when I think about this, I think about it twofold. Individually, the things that we do in this life that, that follow us, that are known by others after we die, and, and Dorcas for a while. Mm -hmm. We had a whole list of things she did in her life that followed after her death. But in the other sense, it's the continuance of the church. Our work is to grow the kingdom, to plant the seed. And so the church continues. So in that sense, our work follows us after we're dead. Right. Our work could follow us through our children and raising them in a godly home. They carry the faith on to that next generation. Congregations that we're a part of to help build and to make strong and they continue on after our death. So it's kind of the, the idea of legacy. Um, it could be writings and sermons and things we teach. It could be letters to individuals that we even write, that that's still there for people to be influenced by. Mike? Yeah, um, Paul actually talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When he's talking about our work, it's built on this foundation, it goes through fire and wants to lay out the you know, Mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. All right, um, let me read verses 14 to 20, and we'll briefly touch on these before we close out. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, 
and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furloughs. All right, so the first picture we have is the Son of Man and what is he doing? He's riding on a cloud. What's this a picture of? Just generally speaking, when you see the Lord on a cloud, the Lord coming on a cloud. It's the return of Christ coming. That's it. He is given to us that he'll return to the little kingdom of the Father and then judgment will come upon all men. Yeah, very generally it's judgment. And it says specifically that when he returns, he's going to come as he went, literally on a cloud, in final judgment. This is a picture of judgment being on a white cloud, you know, pure and holy. He's wearing the golden crown. There's a victory crown that is with him there. And he's going to reap the earth. So he's going to gather to him those who belong to him. But then what's the other picture, verses 17 and following there? There's another reaping, another harvest. So one harvest by the Son of Man and the other harvest... Yeah, here's the wrath of God. We're being given the picture. Here, here's what's going to happen. Now, whether this is the, the picture that's specifically talking about, okay, God and Him talking about this judgment on Rome, that, you know, the faithful are going to survive. The Lord's going to take them and they're going to be at home with Him and here's what's going to happen with those who have worshipped the beast. Or if this is the final judgment, it's just simply giving us a preview, which there's pretty good evidence it's giving us that preview and then 15 to the end of the book gives us greater detail on what's unfolding here. But, be that as it may, they're going to be gathered up like grapes would be gathered up, put into that wine press and they're going to be smashed. And there's, it's so vivid in its description, there's going to be so much blood, it's going to do what? Come up to a horse's bridle, which, depending on how big your horse is, about yay high, right? Maybe five feet? Depending on whether the horse... And please don't tell me the horse is eating grass. That's not the picture being given here. The horse is standing up, right? And his bridle's about there. And how far does that go? 184 miles, some say as much as 200, however long that is, it's in that range there. It's how deep that blood is. It's just saying God is going to completely crush them. That's what's happening with the enemies of God. So what does that do for the saints who are facing persecution, suffering day in and day out? It's meant to encourage them. They will overcome. He is going to overcome. And to me, when you look at, at 13, God gives them a picture of the enemy and his helpers who says, I know who they are, and I'm showing you who they are. And then, and then in 14, he gives them a picture of God and his helpers. Okay. So you've got the beast with the iron teeth and all that stuff. And you, you've got a lamb. Who's going to come out overwhelmingly dominant? It's the lamb. The lamb will. So hang in there. And we're in no different of a position today. No matter how it looks, God will be victorious. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, Lord willing, 15, 16 next week.